It's the DreamItAlive.com show. I'm your host, Ash Kumra, co-founder of DreamItAlive.com. DreamItAlive.com is a global community guiding you to create your dream life with scientifically proven visualization tools, dream boards, and helpful personal development content. Come check it out at DreamItAlive.com. Why not become the best version of yourself? So all about being the best version of yourself kind of leads me to introduce this amazing guest that we have. Uh, I've known Lauren for quite a while now. Uh, We both were honored at the White House in 2011 for being two of the top 100 entrepreneurs uh, that were young entrepreneurs at the time. It was called the Impact 100 Awards, and I know they still have it. So big ups to Michael Simmons and the whole team out there with Impact. And, you know, what's really amazing about Lauren is that she is just constantly innovating, driving, and just making things happen. As we get to learn her story, I mean, she's created her own, you know, winery. She created a luxury marketing branding company. She's been a venture capitalist. And most recently, uh, she created a book, which I'm happy to say is an Amazon best-selling business memoir, The Path Redefined, Getting to the Top on Your Own Terms. And there's many, many audiences that will learn from this. One, naturally, is uh, the rise of uh, media and promotions for women entrepreneurs. Um, Lauren, I know, has a lot to say about that. I know that was one of our core markets for this book. But overall, um, whether you're a male or female or you're an entrepreneur or you want to become an entrepreneur, Lauren's journey, Lauren's advice, and Lauren's things could really help you get perspective on what you need to do. So without further ado, uh, Lauren, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me on, Ash. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. It's been uh, something we've been wanting to have for a while. So, Lauren, tell me a little about your journey, how you got to where you are right now. My goodness. So, you know, I'm, I'm where I am today, I think, in large part because of my curiosity about life and my, my drive to see things come full circle. And so I think that, you know, a large part of what I like to call the evolution of Lauren Mylan Bias has been, you know, what I've realized I'm good at combined with what my personal interests are and where I see opportunity. That's awesome. Well, talk us through your first successful business venture and how and why, what was, what did it take to make it succeed? So my first business venture. So I've really always been an entrepreneur, but, you know, that that can mean many different things. So in the beginning of my career, you know, I had a a great modeling career and then that morphed into something else. So my first business um, outside of just really being Lauren was to start um, an award-winning, internationally recognized vineyard and winery that made me the youngest self-made winery owner in the country. And, you know, what did that take to to make that business successful, it took uh, a lot of thick skin. It took a lot of evolution of myself and how I communicated with people, but also my my company and the way that my company was branded and spoke to consumers and welcomed consumers. And it was also, you know, about providing an experience. So it was making sure that my vineyard and winery could provide one of the best experiences, hands down, for people who came to visit and then ultimately driving sales um, and continued sales to keep the company afloat. So I've interviewed in the past um, several models. I even interviewed um, the Miss Nevada USA um, a while back, and I've interviewed some celebrities. And like you, they all have leveraged their self-brand to get them leverage in other business ventures. my question to you is, is how, how important is self-branding to you or is that something that doesn't come to your mind when in terms of you know, becoming successful? And this could apply to you or for anyone else. Absolutely. So I think that you know, I, I, self-branding, I guess we'll call it personal branding, yep. but I think that it's very important because it's the way that you communicate who you are and what you're about to the outside world. And as quickly as success can come, um, so can other people's you know, interpretations of who you are and what you stand for. And so, you know, I speak a lot about the importance of of controlling your own voice and taking the opportunity that you have now, especially with the help of social media, to make sure that who you are and what you're about is being reflected in the most accurate and, and genuine way possible. 
Yeah, well, no, that's that's well well said on that, um, and that kind of leads me to talk about your book, uh, Path Redefined: Getting to the Top in Your Own Terms. I actually read it over the weekend, and it's a really good book. I took down some really good notes. What inspired you to create this book? My goodness. Well, thank you first of all for reading it. I'm glad that you enjoyed it, and you know what what has inspired me to to write the book was really having the opportunity. And so I think that every good entrepreneur uh, has to be opportunistic in order to continue innovating and to continue finding success. And so I had, you know, a few unsolicited book offers come my way um, at the end of 2011. And I ended up, you know, going with the, the publishing house that I felt the most comfortable with and that I felt really understood me and who I am and what I stand for. Um, but it was it was something that really came to me, and I, I think we all kind of look for signs sometimes in life or our career that says, yes, I'm going in the right direction. And so I, you know, at first I said, oh, I don't know. I don't think this is the right time. I don't know that I have that much to fill a whole book with in terms of experience. I don't know that my experience is that, you know, riveting or inspiring or empowering that's, that it's worthy of a book. And it took a lot of kind of soul searching for me as well, because you you have to decide how much of of who you are you're willing to share with the outside world and words that you're going to commit to paper that are going to be, you know, in print forever and that my kids are going to read and that my colleagues are going to read and that, you know, my future, you know, life partner is going to read and, um, so it was it was it was a soul searching process for me as well, but ultimately. I did kind of leave it up to God and say, if this is what you want for me, then then kind of command my steps. And so my steps were commanded and that I had several other um, offers and that the one that I ended up going with was the one that felt most natural and that was the easiest conversation to have. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's, that's well said and I appreciate you sharing from the heart that answer. I felt a lot of power when you said that. One of the things that comes to my mind is when you talked about you know, your family and uh, finding a life partner, um, I kind of want to delve into how you balance um, being a, you know, active family member, mother, and being an entrepreneur. And let me show you why. I actually uh, co-founded DreamingLife.com with two dynamic entrepreneurs, two other dynamic entrepreneurs. And one of them is actually a mother of three. And I'm amazed at how Anita is able to balance, you know, her life as a mother raising kids, and they're, they're fairly old now. I mean, one's 13, one is 18, one is uh, 21 now. And it's amazing how she's able to switch from being a mother to being an entrepreneur. And she's just on it. She's just able to balance her life. And my question to you is, is do you find being a mother has helped hone some of your entrepreneurship skills? Yeah, I mean, I think that being a mother, so I'm a single parent, um, just to kind of make that clarification. So, so is Anita. You know, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a single mom, mom, and I've been a single mom for five years, actually two weeks ago marked the, uh, the five-year mark, and I certainly think that those experiences and learning how to juggle interest and demands of time and commitments and responsibilities and also learning how to you know, empower, inspire, coddle, protect, and challenge, which are all the things that are really important to do as a parent, um, have made me a better entrepreneur. And oftentimes people ask me, how on earth did I find the time? And the answer is that I don't find the time, I make the time. And so, you know, I've become uh, acutely aware of not just my blessings, but also, you know, of what I have to do to make things to make things happen. And there's not one moment that I take for granted. There's not one, you know, moment of success that I take for granted. And having to juggle single parenthood with, you know, building a career, um, both of which I'm doing on my own, right? So as an entrepreneur, I'm running my own show. I'm my own boss. I take all the risk. It's, It's a mirror image of my life as a mother, and I certainly think that being able to hone those skills day in and day out, um, you know, through motherhood has, has made me 
an incredible entrepreneur and an even better listener as my kids continue to grow up as well. That's awesome. Well, I, again, I mean, these are some deep answers, and I, I, I feel the passion when you talk about it. And, you know, if I do a research or a Google search on you right now, specifically with this book, you're written up as a, as a moving force for women entrepreneurs. And whether that's something you like or not like, you've been branded as an advocate for women entrepreneurship. And I'm just curious, you know, what are your thoughts on this trend of women entrepreneurs, women needing investments? Because you're in a lot of articles around that. And so what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, my thoughts on it are that I think women are getting their ish together (laughs) more now than they probably ever have. And, you know, it's interesting. I was reading something um, just this weekend that was talking a lot about racism and Ferguson and just adversity, adversity based on our race, adversity based on our life experience or our sexual orientation or the choices that we make in life. And it was interesting because on the topic of, of racism, someone was being interviewed. In this case, it was actually Chris Rock who was being interviewed. And he goes, well, I don't know that much has really changed about the way that the world operates, but our children being, you know, African-Americans, black people, and I'm obviously a black woman, that our children are able to now encounter the nicest, most inclusive types of the majority, right? So simply put, that we are finally experiencing, you know, the most inclusive um, and kind, you know, other side of the coin. <laughs> and that, and I think that, that that translates now into not just how blacks are viewed by whites and how, you know, all other sorts of, of diverse groups are viewed by, by the majority that's long kind of been in control. And that really translates also into women-led business and female entrepreneurship. You know, we are now, I think, finally encountering men who want to understand women, men who want to support women, men who see the value, the business value in having a woman at the table or having a woman in the company or having a woman in the conversation. And so... I think it's this conundrum now of, of all of these hot topics and buzzwords, race, gender, women, money, success, power. And unfortunately, we're moving away from having to have these conventional labels around what someone has to look like in order to, to represent any of those, those kind of subsets, if you will. And so I think it's, it's an amazing time for me to be able to be in this in this cross section, especially considering that I represent, you know, a couple of those boxes, and um, but I but I think that women are are also finally feeling empowered, and I think women are long inspired. But what did we do with the inspiration? Mm. I think women are finally empowered um, because we have people that are on the other side that are finally showing some appreciation for the value that we bring to the table. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, you know, I could personally relate to what you're talking about, at least from um, an outsider perspective, because uh, I co-founded uh, Dream Alive with two women entrepreneurs, Anita and Aaron. And first time I ever did it, I mean, this is, uh, I've had a few businesses prior to Dream Alive, and this is by far the most fulfilling, not from a growth and from what it is and all that. Yeah, it's the hugest business opportunity I've ever had. That's why I'm on it. But just because the perspective of the masculine and feminine energy together working on things creates products, experiences, and conversations that have never been, that you can never create before. And, um, you know, I, I, and why I bring that up is because I think the best way to create a bulletproof, unreplicable business is to combine, you know, male female at the leadership helm together because when you create that stuff together you you can't ever create it again like there'll never be something just like dreaming alive because of the combination of our energies and uh, i'm just sharing that antidote to support what you're saying so it's kind of cool what you're saying and uh yeah no I, i love that um my final question before we dive into some audience questions i'm happy to say we have a couple really good questions around entrepreneurship for you from the audience is for 2015 and beyond, what are your own dreams and goals? Like, What's on your life board, dream board, internally or externally, that you want to accomplish? 
Oh, goodness. Well, I think my life goals for 2015 are deeply personal. And I think, you know, we, we often hear people talking about, can you have it all? Can you have personal and professional success? Can they coexist? And I do think that they can coexist, but I don't think that you can that you can upstart them, that you can build them and create them from nothing into something concurrently. And so I feel like I've, ca- I've taken the last five years of my life and really um, poured my heart and soul into my career, and that's been incredible. And so for 2015, my goal is to pour my heart and soul into making Lauren whole, which is, you know, the personal side of my life and kind of rounding out um, the rest of my family. So I have two amazing, amazing children um, that inspire me every single day. And there, there's a missing link, and that's a life partner of some sort. And, um, you know, it's funny because people will always say to me, oh, you meet people all the time. Yes, I meet people all the time. I meet guys all the time. I meet great guys all the time. But to have that kind of profound spiritual connection, mental connection, to have someone that you really want to kind of go to the ends of the earth with, that isn't something that you meet, uh, you know, just in your neighborhood bar or at some after work networking event or a charity event. So that's my goal for 2015 um, because I do think that in order to to maintain this kind of frenetic, demanding uh, career, you have to be whole and complete in every single part of your life. And so for a certain period of time, we can all ignore, you know, our kind of personal, our very deep personal desires, but then there is a point where we need those to continue to fuel us, um, and it's great to be able to share share the joys and the successes with my children, but it would be that much better with a with the appropriate life partner. So that's my, my 2015 goal, so that I can then face 2016 feeling completely whole and ready to tackle everything else that's going to come my way. Well, I, I, I normally don't plug my own company, DreamingAlive.com, but I'm going to for a quick second only because I feel that's going to help you find your dream partner. Um, I have found both personally and with many people um, that when you put down in a clear visual format like a dream board, who are you, what kind of person you're looking for in your life and you subconsciously focus on those images and those intentions, those type of things will uh, surround you. So I know you meet great guys. It's obvious. I mean, you're a great person and you're out there and you're in the world. And I'm I'm sure that there's many men that are eyeing you because you're such a great catch. But the right types of people you will meet because you will subconsciously put yourself in certain types of events. You subconsciously will, um, you know, look to meet certain types of people through mutual friends because it's in your mind because of your dream board. So if you're not using our site or if you're not doing this at home um, I, as a home Yeah, I certainly, I, I, my thing, Ash, is that I speak with, I speak with conviction and, and with a lot of intention. And I think that when you speak, when you speak about things as they're going to happen, you really truly speak them into existence. So I do think that I'm on the road to something really good already. Yeah. So I think I'm, I think I'm halfway there, but I, I certainly want to go the, the, um, the rest of the way uh, in 2015. So that's my 2015 goal. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, let's dive into some uh, cu- some questions from the audience. First question is from Shannon, and Shannon wanted to know, hey, Lauren, um, I know in this interview we haven't really talked about your role as someone who's done investments and invested in companies. Um, what, are your, what are some women industry businesses you feel are really fundable right now? So I, I want to kind of say that the caveat is that I believe in supporting women, but when it comes to, you know, making monetary investments, I certainly don't silo them and, and say that I only support, you know, women, women-led women companies. You know, I look for amazing opportunities, and they can be led by men or women or, you know, they could be led by aliens, like really, but <laughs> um, but I but I look for good opportunities, and that doesn't mean that I don't support women. Absolutely, I do, but I think that uh, it's I think it's unrealistic to then, you know, say that you're only going to monetarily invest in one particular type of people because you're going to shoot yourself in the foot with a lot of other opportunities that you then won't won't invest in or won't seize. But you know, there's um. You know, Deborah Jackson has a, an amazing company called Plum Alley. Um, 
you know, Bobble Bar is crushing it. They're doing really, really well right now. Um, you know, I just began advising a company called Cosign. Um, it's, it, two co-founders, one is a man, one is a woman, but they're they're doing really well. And you know, I do think that when you when you invest in women, that you end up having, or when there are women at in leadership roles, that you end up having a company that far better understands how to communicate with their target and how to how to adapt messaging. Mm. And um, you know, there are, there are a lot of wonderful companies and and opportunities that are out there, um, and they're not all led by women but they certainly exist, and, and I'm seeing them and supporting them and rooting them on from every corner. I think what she was asking, though, specifically, and I, I agree with you, by the way, you shouldn't pigeonhole anything on investments, is are there certain like niches, like, for instance, Spanx? That's for women. It's a billion-plus women around the world could use Spanx products, right? Is there anything like that that, might, that you feel could be tapped into that are marketing towards women? And, yeah, you're right, a guy could create that. Uh, well, you know, what's really big right now, and you have a lot of people who are trying to get into the market, um, and there's certainly enough, there's enough consumer demand to go around for everybody, but uh, athletic wear is huge, and, you know, in making, designing athletic wear that is comfortable for women and stylish for women uh, is, is a huge market, kind of the next thing past Lululemon, almost a more fashionable Lululemon, and you're looking at everything from you know, Fabletics to which is uh, something in, in in partnership with Kate Hudson to Ellie to you know the Gap is moving into it. Nike is trying to capture that market, and Under Armour is pushing for women's uh, clothing as well with their "I Will What I Want" campaign. And then you've got you know a lot of other startups again like Ellie, um, Paint Apparel that are all coming into the market now to to really try to to capture that consumer and speak to, you know, the modern day woman who cares about the way that she, she looks and cares about working out and wants to do it all in a very fashion forward way. Okay. So I think cool. that's, I think that's, that's a huge, huge, huge market that I think many people understand. No, I definitely agree with you there. Um, I've done, I'm pretty active in the fitness industry side of the buying products and knowing people who create products. And I definitely have heard similar conversations. So it's great to hear. Garrett has a question for you. He wants to know, hey, Lauren, after writing this book, um, if you had to write a sequel or if you are writing a sequel, what would it be about? Hmm. Good question. So I'm often asked when book number two is coming, yeah. and the answer is that you know, I, don't, I don't feel as though I have enough additional life experience. Everything that I have in terms of life experience and words of wisdom and you know, ways that, that I feel I can help someone else learn or grow is contained in the pages of The Path Redefined. And, you know, that's everything up until literally the day I turned in the final manuscript, August of last year, so August of 2013. And, of course, you know, every day I'm growing and learning and having additional life and professional experiences. And, you know, I probably, I don't think that I'll have more to say or to write for probably another three years. And, um, you know, that's part of me wanting to be very genuine and true to who I am because it's easy to get caught up in, oh, yes, I'm going to write another book. But, you know, I want, I want what I write and what I share with people to be a true reflection of who I am and what I have to offer the world. And so I think anyone could probably, you know, finagle their way through writing another book, but it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be true, genuine, heartfelt experience. So, you know, the sequel, if anything, the book number two is probably going to be, um, you know, along the same lines in terms of something that is, you know, a business format that's empower empowering and inspiring. But what, what it will be exactly, I don't know, because I haven't lived the experience yet to put within the pages of the book. Okay, very cool. Um, last question is from Vanessa, and she wanted to know, what are some of the best tips you got from your mentors? And if you're able to list who they are, uh, that would be great. That's what she asked. Yeah, so I think the, um, well, in terms of tips, that they are contained in the book. Um, so at the end of every single chapter in The Path We Defined, there is a for reflection. And in the for reflection, it is 
kind of going back to the most poignant parts of that particular chapter, referencing them, um, and then, you know, referencing any kind of anecdotes and individuals as well. But, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've ever learned uh, from my life experience, my business experience, and a mentor is to always trust your intuition. And so I always trust my intuition, and I like to say that I trust my intuition, but I always refer to logic. So if it defies logic, I still don't do it. But, you know, trusting our intuition is so important, and so many times we go against it just because we think it's an opportunity that we can't pass up. And, you know, another thing is is to always be yourself because everyone else is taken. And it's so simple to say and so much harder to do because I think everyone gets caught up in wanting to be someone who they see as, you know, a definition of success or a definition of the good life. And they lose sight of who they truly are in trying to, quote, unquote, keep, keep up with the Joneses. And so, you know, I I have learned and it's been confirmed by my mentors, not necessarily taught to me by my mentors, that what oftentimes makes us insecure are the very same things that make us so unique. And so figure out what makes you unique and leverage it. I love that. I love that. I love the leverage word. That's one of the best things that I've gotten from you and I've learned from other successful people is find the things that you leverage in. Well, on that note, Lauren, thank you so much for this interview. And also thank you so much for making the world be a better place. I cannot wait to see your continued endeavors in 2015. And um, yeah, I hope you attain your dream that you had stated too um, very soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. I'm going to dream it alive. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Take care. All right. Thanks so much.